You may take your seats as we open up Scripture for Roy to preach from. Uh, the passage is Luke chapter 22, verse 32 to 48. And beginning at verse 32, the story of Christ crucified. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be persecuted with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying this man really was righteous. All the crowds that had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, went home striking their chests. May God bless the reading of his word. In his book titled The Cross of Christ, author and pastor John Stott hypothetically imagines what it would be like for a non-Christian to attend a religious church service. He writes, Imagine a stranger visiting St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Having been brought up a non-Christian, he knows next to nothing about Christianity, next to nothing about the cross or the good news. Walking along Fleet Street, he's impressed by the grandeur of the building. He marvels that Sir Christopher Wren could have conceived of such an edifice after the Great Fire of London in 1666. As his eyes attempt to take it all in, he cannot help but notice the huge golden cross which dominates the dome. He enters into the building and stands at its most central location, attempting to grasp the size of the place. He cannot help but notice the ground floor being fashioned after the shape of a cross. He walks around inside of this building and observes that each side chapel contains what looks to him like a table on which, prominently displayed, stands a cross. Going downstairs, he walks into the crypt of the famous tombs of such men like Sir Christopher Wren, Lord Nelson, and the Duke of Wellington. And to be sure, engraved on each one of their tombs stands the cross. Returning upstairs, he decides to remain for the church service, which is about to begin. He notices the man sitting beside him wears a small little cross on his lapel, while the lady on the other side has one as a pendant. Suddenly, the congregation stands to sing. We sing the praise of him who died, who died upon the cross. The sinner's hope let him deride. We count the world but loss. From what follows, he comes to realize he's witnessing a communion church service focused on the death of Jesus on the cross. Things are becoming blatantly obvious now, he thinks, as the service ends with the famous hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And although the congregation now disperses after the service, there's a family that stays behind to baptize their child. Joining them at the front of the church, the stranger witnesses the minister pour water over this infant and begins to trace a cross upon its forehead, saying, I now sign you with the cross. And so in the end, the stranger now leaves the cathedral impressed 
but rather puzzled. The repeated instance by word and symbol on the centrality of the cross, it's brought a number of questions in his mind that are left lingering as he, he wonders to himself. And perhaps you're here this morning, a non-Christian, wondering some of these things as well. Perhaps I've just described your church experience for the first time. This unbeliever wonders to himself, do, do Christians really, for the sake of the cross, count this world but loss? Do they really boast in the cross of Jesus Christ alone, and, and do they really sacrifice everything for it? Can the Christian faith be accurately summarized as the faith of Jesus crucified? And last but certainly not least, he thinks, what are the grounds for the concentration and focus on the cross? Why is it such good news for Christians to focus on the centrality of the cross, he wonders? Well, friends, as we come to Luke chapter 23 here this morning, the passage that Andrew just read out for us a few moments ago, I want to take a few minutes to consider that last question for us here this morning. What are the grounds for the concentration and focus upon the cross of Jesus Christ? Why do Christians insist so heavily upon Good Friday as being so good? Especially in light of the gruesome and grotesque images we find in this scene. So friends, think with me now as we consider such questions from Luke 23. And the main point that I want us to see as we come to this passage the good news of Easter is that Jesus endured God's wrath without mercy so that we may endure God's mercy without wrath. Jesus endured God's wrath without mercy so that we may endure God's mercy without wrath. I can't remember who penned that famous um, saying, but I've taken it and used it as a main point. And we're going to see that in three, three points, a prayer of forgiveness, a pronouncement of mercy, and a pledge of submission. A prayer, a pronouncement, and a pledge. So Luke 23, verse 32. Luke, the author of the gospel, tells us, two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. Death by crucifixion was an intentionally slow and painful process. Uh, designed by the Phoenicians, adopted by the Romans, it was uh, designed to maximize the most amount of pain in the seeming shortest amount of time. A brief reveal of the circumstances of how we got here, I think, are in order. Luke informs us that just prior to his crucifixion, Jesus had a near-death experience while praying in the garden. As he contemplates the cup of his father's wrath that awaited him on that cross, Luke tells us that Jesus sweat great drops of blood in anticipation of that wrath. Many of the gospel accounts record for us the conversation in which this took place. Jesus said to his disciples, My soul is crushed with grief even to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going on a little farther, he fell down with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. See, the only thing more terrifying in the mind of Jesus than being executed for public crimes was being crucified for eternal sins. Jesus had sweat great drops of blood because he felt the weight of the wrath he was about to endure. Once arrested, he endures a religious trial before the religious authorities where he's falsely accused of blasphemy against the Jews, a little later on, treason against the empire. 
Uh, One commentator has said it rightly. He says, in an outrageous inversion of biblical justice, guilty men put on their robes of religion to sit in judgment over and against the Son of God. They put on their robes of religion to condemn an innocent man and sitting in judgment over the judge of all men. Condemned to die the death of a criminal now, Jesus is led away like a lamb to the slaughter, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. He opened not his mouth. He was silent like a sheep before its shearers. History has informed us that it was customary for Romans to subject the victim of a crucifixion to what they would call a Roman flogging, a public scourge, a beating like no other. The victim was stripped of his clothing, he was bound to an upright pole, and he was begun to be beaten and spat upon and whipped by a flagellum, a Roman whip that was designed primarily to accomplish the ripping out of chunks of flesh. I won't go into too much more detail, little children are listening, but just know that these guys are experts at beating their victims within inches of their life. See, the only law that the Romans had when carrying out a public scourge was that they could not kill the victim before they got to the cross. Other than that, as long as they didn't kill the man, their methods were, in fact, free range for them to do. Jesus has proceeded to be mocked as a prophet, mocked as priest, mocked as king, and as a final tort, his bloodied and bludgeoned body is then forced to carry his own cross to the place known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. We know it as Calvary. In Latin, Calvaria is a medical term referring to the top part of the skull. So in all instances, this was the place of death. This was the place where men and women would come to die their final death on this earth. The last thing that they would experience was the haunting terrors of the cross. And as he hangs to die this humiliating death in a prominent location, the Romans did this as a deterrent to stop rebellion against the empire, so they would put them in a very prominent location where there was a lot of foot traffic for people to see. He dies there for six gruesome hours and he begins to be mocked and scorned yet again by every kind of class and citizen of sinner. Matthew describes the scene for us. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. And even the robbers who were with him, says Matthew, who were crucified with him, No better off than him reviled him, Matthew says, in the same way. He's mocked by royalty, he's mocked by peasants, he's mocked by the religious, he's mocked by the soldiers, and mocked by the criminals. He's crucified amongst the criminals, fulfilling, once again, prophecy of Isaiah 53. He was numbered amongst the transgressors. And yet his the first glimmer of good news and hope that we have this Good Friday, dear friends, that even in the most bleak and dire of situations of the Son of God, where he is mocked, beaten, and crucified, he prays for his enemies. He he prays for his enemies. Verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Notice in this first cry, Jesus refers to God as Father. He would do so again as he goes to breathe his last in verse 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But in the very middle cry that's recorded in Mark's gospel and I believe Matthew's, Jesus doesn't refer to God as Father, but simply as God. 
crying out that famous cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Showing us that separation that occurred between Jesus in his humanity and the Father to punish human sins. This was indeed his darkest hour on the cross, friends. Jesus prays for those who had crucified, scorned, and mocked his name, showing us the true nature of the Son of God in this moment. Who, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as something to be exploited in that moment, something to be grasped for, but he humbled himself. We're, we're talking about a man who could have called upon 12 legions of angels to come down at that very moment. Each angel as zealous as the next to acquit their Lord and King. Talking about a man who could have rained fire from heaven and consumed them with a prayer. A man who was able to control the wind and the waves, the stars and the planets that he spoke into existence. Raising the dead, healing the sick. And yet instead of doing any of those things, He did not count the equality he had as something to be used, exploited, or grasped. He humbled himself, and he modeled the very thing that he told to his disciples. Matthew 5.44, I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Jesus prays for his enemies. He prays for those who are crucifying him. A lot of ink has been spilled over these verses. What does Jesus mean when he prays, forgive them? What what was he actually saying or praying for? I certainly don't want to go into too much detail here this morning or say that uh, everyone that day found forgiveness because of Jesus' prayer. But I think this does go to show, if we can know anything about the prayer of Jesus, it, it shows us that Jesus and the Father are willing to forgive even the most heinous of sins that we've committed. Even those who are nailing him to the tree were not so far gone to find the hope of forgiveness. As as Richard Sibbs, the famous Puritan, would tell us, there is more power and mercy found in the cross than there is sin in us. There is more power and mercy found in the cross of Jesus Christ than there is sin and condemnation in us. Jesus Praise for his enemies, friends. But not only for his enemies, he, he prays for what Charles Spurgeon would say. Praise for them. He prays for them. Charles Spurgeon, in commenting on this verse, he says, I love this prayer, he says, because of the indistinctness of it. Jesus prayed for them without indicating who them actually included, thus giving hope to all sinners. Now, into that pronoun, them, I feel I can crawl. Can you get in there as well? Oh, by a humble faith, says Spurgeon. Appropriate the cross of Christ by trusting in it and get into that big little word, them. Dear friends, if you are here this morning, if you're here listening to this sermon not yet trusting Jesus Christ to acquit you of the sins that you've committed against the holy God, let me be the first to tell you that you have the greatest opportunity in this prayer that Jesus prays. He he prays this prayer with a certain kind of indistinct character because Jesus, says Spurgeon, wanted to leave the cross available and open to any who would come here today so that we, by faith in Christ, can appropriate the cross of Christ and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And in fact, that very afternoon, that very same day, one of those criminals who were crucified next to him would himself crawl into that big little word, them. Which moves us onto our second point here this morning, a pronouncement of mercy. Verse 39, a pronouncement of mercy. One of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. 
But the others answered him, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are being punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. This man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. See, for centuries, the, 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 the people of Israel had anticipated the coming of their king. And it seemed to an increasing number of Israelites through the ministry of Jesus that he was beginning to become that very king that they were anticipating for many centuries. That is, up until he's beaten and mocked and crucified and scorned. And yet somehow that day, one of those criminals understood that Jesus was the coming Messiah that he had pro promised to be. Jesus pronounces mercy upon this man. Today you will be with me in paradise. Friends, if we ever needed to know that salvation is not based upon anything we do, but upon the righteousness of Jesus, this is it right here. This scene is it. This man was doing nothing good at the time. He was literally dying for all of the things that he had done wrong, all of the bad things. He's dying the death of a crucified criminal, and yet Jesus proclaims paradise would be with him today. You can almost hear the reaction of the angels when they would see Jesus entering into the presence of heaven, into the gates of heaven that day. Here comes the Son of God, and he's, he's got someone coming with him. He's, he's, is he on the list? Michael, is he on the list? Right? We, we don't know the name of this man. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know specifically the things that he did. But we do know one thing that this man trusted in Jesus Christ that day. And he got nothing of what he deserved. Oh, friends, if you ever needed a better picture of the gospel, the great exchange that happened, all of his unrighteousness being placed upon Jesus so that Jesus could place upon him his obedience to his Father, this is that picture. This is the good news of the gospel, friends, that all of our unrighteousness, our sins, our crimes can be placed upon this lamb who was led to the cross so that we can acquire his perfect obedience, not through the things we do or anything we say, simply by trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Perhaps it was the prayer of Jesus that led to this man's conversion in verse 42. Perhaps he knew that there was forgiveness when Jesus prayed that prayer. One wonders if that was the turning point. Maybe it was the suffering and the silent suffering that Jesus had endured on the cross that day that led to his faith. Perhaps it was the, the mocking description above Jesus on the cross, Hail, King of the Jews, that led to his conversion. We don't know much about the details, but, but we do know that the criminal on the cross could perceive the glory of the king when, when the king's glory was most concealed. This criminal could perceive the glory of the king for, for centuries they had anticipated this king, even in that very moment when the king's glory was most evidently concealed. There was nothing appealing about the Son of God in this moment, friends. Nothing, humanly speaking, was being offered to this man. The only thing that he had was the image of the Son of God praying for his enemies, suffering for sins. And he crawled into that big little word, then. He appropriated that cross by faith alone, and he believed Jesus was the Messiah he claims to be, which is why he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this man had that pronouncement placed upon him, today you will be with me, says Jesus. Which leads us to our third and final point, a pledge of submission. A pledge of submission, verse 44. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle, and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. 
And when the centurion saw what had happened, he began to glorify God, saying, This man really was righteous. And all the crowds that had gathered for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place went home, striking their chests. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So friends, Jesus is crucified. He's now dead and he's soon to be buried. The sun's light begins to be blotted out, filling the land. All of a sudden, the cameras turn away from the cross and onto the temple in Jerusalem. The scene begins to get very small. Luke gives this interesting detail in verse 45. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle. Some of your uh, translations might say the veil was torn in two. The curtain of the temple symbolized uh, the separation that occurred between a holy God and and sinful man. It was a a vivid reminder that mankind could not just simply enter into the presence of of a holy God in an unmediated kind of way. He he always needed to have a a sacrifice for sins on his behalf if he was to have someone to, to represent him and to enter into that presence of God. But now, when Jesus dies upon the cross, Luke informs us, his readers, that the curtain of the temple was torn down the middle, showing us the way to God's no longer hindered and restrictive, but it's now open and free through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Think of it like this. If if there was still sin needing to be paid, or if there was still sin remaining that Jesus had not atoned for on the cross, then the veil would not have been torn. So by the fact that the curtain is torn in the temple indicates that Jesus has made the way available and open. He's paid for every single one of his people's sins that the Father had given him in eternity past. I think this also gives weight to the fact that Jesus really did die. You know, it's it's so easy and so often we forget that Jesus actually became a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He he literally bore our sins in his body on that tree. Uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. So the, so the idea is that if the wages of sin is death, Jesus really died, then he really took the wages of sin. He bore those sins in his body on the tree, showing us the full payment and curse that our sins deserve were really laid upon Jesus. He died. As one preacher has rightly said, the completeness of Jesus' rejection on the cross mirrors the completeness of rejection that our sins deserve. The completeness of Jesus' rejection on the cross mirrors the completeness of rejection that our sins deserve. And all of this culminates in verse 46 where Jesus gives this pledge of submission. He cried out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And saying this, he breathed his last. Not even in his final moments, not even in his final moments of life does Jesus deny his heavenly Father. Not even in his final words does he doubt the providence of God. Not even in his final words does Jesus forget that God would vindicate the righteous. I mean, we are just so quick, we're so prone to forget and doubt the goodness of God, aren't we? Uh, Andrew was saying this on Wednesday at the pre-preach. We get one nail in our tire, and all of a sudden God hates us. All right? That's what we think. And yet here's Jesus being crucified for sin, being a curse for us, and not even in that moment does he deny his heavenly Father's goodness, does he doubt the fact that God would vindicate him. He believed his Father's will to the very last drop. He was obedient even unto the very last drop for us. The completeness of Jesus' rejection mirrors the rejection that we deserve and our sins deserve. He became a curse for us. So going back to our opening question that was posed to us here this morning, friends, what grounds do we have for the concentration and focus upon the cross of Jesus Christ? What makes Good Friday so evidently good? 
Well, according to Luke, on the grounds that we have here in these verses, Luke informs us that the one who was all-powerful chose to lay down his life and become powerless for us. The one who saved others from the wrath of his father did not attempt to save himself. The one who was mocked, beaten, and crucified as the king of the Jews really was the king of the Jews, the king of kings, the lord of lords. Good Friday is good because what God in Christ has done for us in dying for sinners, that although you and I deserve nothing less than the full weight and wrath of an eternal God that our sins deserve, Jesus, the God-man in flesh, has come to take our sins upon himself and paid for them in his body on that tree. In doing so, he's laid upon us all of his unmerited righteousness and obedience to his Father, and he has credited those works to our account when we have received, trusted, accepted the death of Christ as payment for our sins by believing that he rose from the dead, we too can have eternal life when we die and go to be with him in paradise. Friends, that's the good news that is being offered to us in the death of Jesus Christ here today. You can have your sins forgiven and acquitted of your crimes because of what Jesus has done for you here at Calvary's Hill. Each and every sin we commit will be punished in in the next life. Each and every sin we commit in this life will be paid for in the next, either by the sinner in hell for all eternity, or it will be paid for, for in full by Jesus Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. Let me finish here today with the words from Romans chapter 5. Paul writes in verses 6 to 8, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were criminals, Christ died for the ungodly. So friends, let us rejoice this day that God so humbly came, lived, died, and as we will see on Sunday, rose from the dead, showing us the glorious good news of the gospel of God that can save even the worst of criminals here this morning. I love what Thomas Watson said, the famous Puritan pastor. When God calls a man, he does not repent of it. God does not, as many friends do, love one day and hate another. As princes who make their subjects favorites and afterward throw them into prison, this is the blessed hope of a saint. His condition admits no alteration. God blots out his people's sins. He never blots out their name. Let us rejoice that Good Friday is the good news of Jesus blotting out our sins and never going back on that promise, friends. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you so much. We thank you that you have sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, fully God, fully man, perfect in all of his ways, God in flesh, who has come to to offer the heart of grace, your heart, to expose your grace and your mercy and your goodness and your glory. Father, we thank you that true hope, lasting forgiveness is found in none other than Jesus Christ who died on a cross for our sins. We ask, Lord, that if there's anyone here this morning who has not appropriated that cross, that they would do do so by faith in Jesus, trusting in him and nothing in them, and crawling into that big little word, them, so that they would be forgiven and find paradise with Jesus when they go to be with him. Help us to reflect on the goodness of the cross, on your grace that was displayed, and may we walk out of here rejoicing 
of the Son of God. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.